As we get into a new group of Bible stories, I want you to be thinking about our new big picture question, which should be up there, and it's why does the church exist? And I know with Mrs. Williams, you guys have been talking about the early church. And of course, when you talk about the church, you mean we're talking about all the fancy buildings that get built all around the world, right? Mm -hmm. When we talk about the church? Mm -hmm. What? No. It's not? No. When we talk about the church, what are we talking about, Miss Raina? All the people and all the Christians inside. That's right. We're talking about believers, no matter where they are, all around the world. Anyone who trusts Jesus as their Savior, they become part of what we call the church. All right. But our question says, why does the church exist? Of course, we're not talking about the building. We're talking about people, um, believers who want to gather to glorify God. But why? Uh, why does God unite people together to be the church? Because, you know, it could be that you trust in Jesus and then you just kind of go do your own thing and be by yourself. It could have been that way. But God wanted to gather people together. So I want you to think about that question, and then I will answer it when our story is over. And you'll see over here, I covered up the answer, because a lot of times you guys will say, oh, but the answer's right there, right? But I tricked you this time, and I covered up ahead of time. <laughs> so just help me remember that after I give you the answer, I'll uncover that one, okay? All right, so I called on Miss Avonlea. I want her, I have a scroll with some important words on it that I would like for you to zip on up here and you read very loudly for us, okay? I want you to stand right up there and read so everyone can hear you. He was led like a sheep to the slaughter. 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 And as a lamb before the shearer. Shearer? What is it called? Shearer. Shearer is silent. So he did not open his mouth. In his humiliation, he was deprived of justice. Who can speak of the his descendants? For he or his life was taken from the earth. All right, so Miss Avenue, tell me what that means. Um, mm. <laughs> that was a hard one, wasn't it? And it has big words. So sometimes, but this is out of the Bible. Sometimes, thank you ma'am, that was very good reading. Sometimes we need help understanding things that are in the Bible, don't we? So in today's story, we're going to read about a man who read those very same verses that we just read, and someone helped him to understand them. So let's back up a little bit and review what you've uh, learned over the last several weeks with Mrs. Williams. And you, I think, have been talking about the early church. Um, the early church, I think from your stories, you would say that they definitely had some struggles. It wasn't all smooth sailing for the early Christians. Some members were like very selfish, like Ananias and Sapphira, who remembers that story. Mm -hmm. Other members were arrested, they were mistreated, hurt, or even killed because of believing in Jesus. But through it all, God was using these hard times in the early church to strengthen and grow believers, individual believers, and the church in a whole bunch of different ways. And all of this was done by the Holy Spirit's power. Not by people themselves doing things, it was the Holy Spirit's power helping the church to get through the struggles, learn things, and grow. And today, we're going to learn about a man who led someone else to Jesus, and our story is called Philip and the Ethiopian. 
Can everybody say Ethiopian? Ethiopian. Ethiopian. Where do you think the Ethiopian, the, uh, Ethiopian man was from? What do you think, Cliff? He was from Ethiopia. Okay? And I'll show you shortly on the map where Ethiopia isn't. Okay? If you want, if you have your Bibles and you'd like to find our story today, it's in the book of Acts, which is where you've been studying. And this is going to be chapter 8, and we're going to start at verse 26. So, the last time that I was with you in November, our lesson was about how um, Jesus gave his disciples and all believers, everyone who follows him, how he gave them a job to do. Who remembers what that job was? So I'm asking you to remember a long time back, but maybe it's been repeated. What was the job that Jesus gave his disciples and all believers to do? Yes, Ms. Tell people about him. That's right, to tell people about him. He said, go into all the world and preach the gospel. Make disciples of people from every nation. So, Philip was one of those people who heard those instructions. And he obeyed the instruction and he left Jerusalem and went to Samaria to preach the good news. Do you like that picture of Philip? He's hurrying off to Samaria there because he's, he's obeying immediately, isn't he? That's right. Actually, I'll show you where he went. You can see here on the map, here's Jerusalem where most of the disciples started out. And, and Jesus said, he gave, Jesus gave his instructions right here in Jerusalem. And so Philip obeyed. He went out and he went up here. He was up here in this area called Samaria. Okay? So he was pretty far away from Jerusalem there. He, he hurried on and, and went up to Samaria. So crowds of people up there in Samaria saw God's power working through Philip. And when they heard the good news that Philip was preaching, they believed in Jesus. And because Philip obeyed Jesus' instructions, many lives were changed in Samaria. Many people learned to know Jesus as their Savior. And then, while he was in, still in Samaria, God sent an angel to Philip. It's kind of a silly-looking angel, too, isn't it? Oh, well. God sent the angel to tell Philip, go south to the road, the desert road, that goes down from Jerusalem to Gaza. So, God is telling Philip, he's up here in Samaria, and he's saying, go down to the desert road that goes between Jerusalem and Gaza. So he was asking him to take kind of a big trip, wasn't he? Because do you think he flew in a plane no. from there to there? No, Philip had to walk. He was going to walk to Jerusalem. And then he must have known about the desert road that went between Jerusalem and Gaza. And God was saying, or the angel was telling him, go to that road and just get on it and start walking. Okay? So... Because he said, God has something for you to do. So Philip listened and obeyed. He didn't ask questions. He didn't argue with God. He didn't tell God, well, okay, I think I will do it later because that's a long trip and I got to get stuff ready. No, nope. he immediately went where God told him to go. Has there ever been a time in your life where you felt like, God was talking to you, telling you to do something. Have you ever felt like that? Shelby, do you, have you had an experience like that where you thought, God is telling me to do something? Would you like to share about that? Tell us about it? Okay. But it, you, it's, it was real for you that you felt like God was speaking to you. Yes. Miss um, Kildall. I felt like Okay, that's, yes, that would be a real strong instruction that God would give you to obey your mom. 
Maybe it was at a time when it's like, well, maybe I don't want to obey my mom, but I should obey my mom. Yeah, it was like when we were watching some old how to obey the time. Good job. Very good. Okay, because, you know, now there might, yes. Is that right? And so you listened and obeyed? Yeah. Good. All right. You know, now, some of you might think, well, God doesn't, he, God only spoke to people in the Bible. I don't think he speaks to people today. And maybe you think he speaks only to adults. But you know what? Think. Let's think in our brains because there is a Bible story where God spoke to a young child. We had that story. It's been a long time ago because it was in the Old Testament. Who can think of a story where God very plainly spoke to a young child? Yes, Shelby. The one where um, they thought that the girl was going to die. And he said to get up. Well, in a way, that was Jesus speaking to that girl saying, Arise, Tabitha, so that's true. But she was dead. I'm thinking of a story where he spoke to a, a child who was alive. Spoke very plainly to him. Yes, Abby? Um, in the story where the little boy, I forget his name, if it was maybe Samuel. Samuel and there was a boy there. He's like, did you call me? He's like, no, go back to bed. And like on the third time, he was like, it must be the Lord talking. That's right. Do you remember that story of Samuel back in the Old Testament in the middle of the night? God was calling Samuel, Samuel. So God does speak to children. And he speaks to children today, too. So don't let yourself think that, no, God only speaks to people in the Bible or grown-ups. He speaks to children today, too. All right. Well, Philip obeyed God's instruction immediately, immediately, and he began walking where God instructed him to go. And as he traveled down the desert road, he was now going between Jerusalem and Gaza on that desert road, he heard something. He heard the rumbling of horses pulling a chariot coming in his direction. Well, I didn't know if maybe some of you wouldn't know what a chariot looked like. But that's what a chariot is. Generally, it's pulled by maybe two to four horses. And just, you know, one or two people can ride in the chariot. But that was a that was a very popular way to travel a long time ago. So it's called a chariot. Well, sitting in that chariot was a man who came all the way from Ethiopia. This is the Ethiopian man, and I'll show you where that is. Ethiopia. We're going to move over to this map here. Here's Jerusalem, and that would be Samaria there. And, and, and Philip is traveling on this road from here between Jerusalem and the Mediterranean Sea here. And he meets a man from Ethiopia. And you know where Ethiopia is? Ethiopia is like way down here. So it's really far away. I, I Googled it to see what's the dif uh, distance between Jerusalem and I picked a city in Ethiopia, and it was 1,600 miles. So that man traveled 1,600 miles to go to Jerusalem to worship God. And this man was an important leader. He, was a, he had a very high position in Ethiopia. He was the treasurer to the queen down there. So he was an important person. And now he was not yet a believer, but he was a man who was seeking God. He wanted to find out what to do to please God. He wanted to know more about God. And so he traveled 1,600 miles to Jerusalem to go to the temple there. So it shows he had a great desire to know God and to love God. Well, while the Ethiopian is traveling in his chariot, you know what he's doing? He's reading scripture. He's reading the, a scroll that had the Old 
Testament parts on it. And as the man is traveling and reading, the Holy Spirit gives Philip another instruction. And who has Acts 8.29? Can you get 8.29? Okay, zip on up here, Shelby, and read it very loudly. This is another instruction that Philip is getting from the Holy Spirit. The Spirit told Philip, Go to that chariot and stand near it. And stay near it. And stay near it. Very good. Thanks, ma'am. The Holy Spirit said, go to that chariot and stay near it. Now, the chariot is traveling along. So, imagine if God told us today, um, I want you to jog alongside that bus. Because there's somebody reading their Bible on that bus. And I want you to talk to them. How do you think we would have responded? That'd be an odd uh, instruction. And we would probably be praying for strength to keep up with that bus. But God said, go to that chariot and stay near it. And it wasn't like the chariot was standing still. It was going. So maybe Philip did pray as he ran alongside the chariot. We don't know because it doesn't say in the Bible. And running alongside the chariot, Philip could hear that the Ethiopian official was reading Isaiah out loud. And as Philip hears the man reading God's word, God gives Philip the wisdom to ask just the right question. Mr. Grimson, what was that question? Then Philip ran up to the chariot and heard the man reading Isaiah the prophet. Do you understand what you are reading, Philip asked. All right, thank you, sir, nice reading. So do you understand what you're reading, Philip asked? He was maybe huffing and puffing, going, do you understand what you're reading? You know, and then the official replied, and maybe he stopped his chariot. And he said, well, how can I understand it unless somebody explains it to me? Well, let's stop and think about what are some of the answers that Philip could have given him? Do you think maybe he would have said, um, oh, hey, listen, there is this apostle back in Jerusalem named Peter. He's a really great speaker. He knows a lot about God. So maybe you should go back to Jerusalem and talk to Peter. You think he said that? Or maybe he might have said, well, listen, I've been traveling along this hot and dusty road. I am really tired and hungry. So how about if we meet back here tomorrow? You think he said that to the Ethiopian man? No, I don't think he did either. Thankfully, Philip obeyed his instructions. And he had the wisdom, God gave him the wisdom, to see that this was a man who was seeking God. And the Ethiopian man invited Philip into his chariot. And Philip immediately accepted that invitation and climbed up in that chariot. And so the passage, the scroll, and the passage of scripture that the Ethiopian man was reading was from Isaiah chapter 53. And he was reading the words that Avonlea read for us, those very same words. He was reading those. And he said, the Ethiopian man turned to Philip and he said, tell me, Philip, who is the prophet Isaiah talking about? Is he talking about himself or someone else? Well, Isaiah was talking about the Messiah, the Savior who was to come. So Philip began to tell the Ethiopian man the good news about Jesus. And because Philip explained the scriptures to this man, the Ethiopian man now understood that Jesus was that promised Savior that Isaiah was talking about, and he believed. So as they traveled down the road, they came to some water. And the Ethiopian man said, Philip, what would keep me from being baptized? And then the the Ethiopian man had the chariot stop, and he and Philip went down into the water, and Philip baptized him. 
when they came up out of the water, you know what happened? This is a very interesting thing. The Holy Spirit snatched Philip away, and then the, the Ethiopian man continued on his way home, and he was very happy. So that's kind of a very sudden ending to the story because the Holy Spirit snatched Philip away, and the Ethiopian man traveled on home. So, you know, sometimes I wish that every opportunity to share the gospel was as easy as walking up to a person and having them ask me to tell them about things in the Bible. So uh, it doesn't always happen that way. The Holy Spirit set up a very extraordinary circumstance for Philip. And because Philip obeyed those instructions, the Ethiopian official became a believer. And so boys and girls, this story has a lot to teach us about immediate obedience, about obeying right away. Philip didn't make excuses about how far away the desert road was or how uncomfortable he would feel running alongside the chariot of a stranger. Instead, he listened and he obeyed. Jesus' final command to his disciples was to baptize them to make disciples and baptize them. And the early church, those members of the early church took those instructions very seriously. Philip listened and obeyed, did he? And also, the Ethiopian man, he believed and he asked to be baptized right away to show his new faith. So his obedience was immediate too. When Philip was carried away with the, by the Spirit, the Ethiopian man went on his way rejoicing. He was headed home, and so we know that he went home to Ethiopia and he carried the truth of Jesus with him to Ethiopia. Isn't it amazing how God is causing the good news about Jesus to spread now to different parts of the world? The Holy Spirit led Philip to do some kind of unusual things. But as a result, this man was going to take that ride 1,600 miles away and share the gospel down in Ethiopia. So all along, boys and girls, God's plan has been to glorify his name through the church. So here's the answer to our question. Why does the church exist? The church exists to glorify God by worshiping him, by showing his love, and by telling others about Jesus. In our story today, Philip, who is a member of the church, showed his love for a complete stranger, didn't he? And he told that complete stranger about Jesus. And God was glorified through it. Can you imagine probably how excited Philip felt afterwards as he was thinking, Wow, look at the amazing things that God did here. How he put me in the right place at the right time to meet this man. And I'm sure Philip, at that moment, praised and glorified God. So, why does the church exist? The church exists to glorify God by worshiping him, showing his love, and telling others about Jesus. 